some of you guys have heard part of the story before. Maybe you've heard all of it. I don't remember. I'm 55. My brain sometimes just doesn't remember stuff. Back in 96, um, when Haley was half the size of JoJo, she was maybe two, we, uh, we were stationed in the Caribbean, uh, Naval Station Guantanamo Bay. And, and you've heard this before, that we didn't work very hard down there. I mean, the military doesn't work very hard anyway when it's on shore duty, and especially when it's in the Caribbean. You know, and, and you've got this big, beautiful bay, and you got all this beautiful water. Why work very hard? You know, just take, take a vacation on the taxpayer dime. That's what we did. And I think I've told you this before, that a lot of afternoons around 3 o'clock, we'd knock off work and we'd go down to the fishing shack and down to the pier and we'd cast a line or two or three or four, drink a beer or two. One weekend I had, I had weekend duty, which meant I had, to, I had to stay on that side of the base. I had to sleep in the barracks and I'd just make sure that everything was working okay. And my buddies all went fishing and Danielle and Emma, or excuse me, Danielle and and Haley joined, they came over, they took the ferry ride from where we lived on the other side of the base and just joined me for the afternoon, probably because they were bored too. And The boys were all down at the fishing pier, so I drove the golf cart down there to join them and just sat around and they were fishing and Haley was just in her tiny little shorts and a little tank top. She had this big old hat on and these sunglasses that were way too big for her face. And my friend Clark kind of invited her to come out to the edge of the dock because he was fishing and... He said, you want to go fishing with me? And so she takes this make-believe fishing pole that she had and she casts it to the line and she starts to reel like this. And so Clark got going with her and next thing I know, the both of them are doing the fishy dance, singing here, fishy, 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 fish, as they were reeling in the make-believe fish. And it was just, you know, for a dad, it was just kind of the cutest thing ever. But anyway, I digress. Clark and I and the guys, there were about five or six of us, we would fish many afternoons within the week, and sometimes we caught things, and sometimes we caught nothing. Once in a blue moon, we'd rent a boat. We'd go down to MWR, and we'd rent a boat for the evening, and we'd go out fishing at night, because in Cuba, you'd go fishing at night because it was just too hot in the course of the day to go fishing, and the fish bit better at night. So that's when we would go out, kind of like the disciples did. Sometimes we caught a little bit here and there. Sometimes we caught enough to pay back for our boat rental and the gas. We would generally catch the fish and we'd sell them to the Jamaicans for like $2 a pound. They got off pretty easy. And some nights we came up absolutely short, just like the disciples did on a couple of different occasions. And kind of like most churches do on most occasions, metaphorically speaking. Today we're going to kind of hear why many congregations don't catch a whole lot of fish, but more importantly, we're going to hear some of the basic principles to become better fishermen of men, principles that Jesus would have us learn so that going forward, we can catch more fish. If you have your Bibles handy, I'd like to invite you to go back to the gospel lesson that we just heard for this morning, or if you have your bulletin handy, feel free to grab those too. I know I'm going to put the words on the screen, but we're going to kind of just go through this a little bit here and a little bit there. And find these basic principles, kind of look at them as a treasure trove. And we hear this. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples besides the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, we know that to be James and John, and two other disciples. Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. We heard last Sunday on Easter Sunday during our reading that Jesus promised that he would catch up with his disciples again after his resurrection. He, in, he instructed Mary and Mary to go tell the disciples to head up to the Sea of Galilee and there he would catch up with them, right? Right? And they did that. They followed those instructions. Now, as we heard just moments ago in our gospel lesson, this was the third time that Jesus had appeared to them after the resurrection. So they'd already seen him twice. But this instruction still stood. Go up to Galilee, go up to the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus would meet them there. And again, they did just that. 
That's a good thing. They followed his instructions. They heard Jesus' directive, and they followed through. In the same way, when the Lord points us in a certain direction, it's good and right for us to follow through. I think you would agree with that. But a lot of people ask, well, how do I know if I'm hearing right from the Lord? How do I know if I'm getting direction from the Lord? How do I know if God is really guiding me, especially in the way to go? They're smart people. You understand this. It all starts with prayer, but specifically a a form of prayer like a listening prayer, a contemplative kind of prayer. It's, It's really giving an active ear to the Lord for what is He saying? What is He communicating? And and for us to be able to pick up on those clues, which sometimes, just if we're honest with ourselves, isn't the easiest thing to do, especially when we're when we presuppose what we think God is already saying. And I think it's for those reasons that the Apostle Paul told us to pray nonstop, right? To pray without ceasing. Because when we constantly seek the Lord in prayer, and then we go silent for a while, really trying to actively listen for what the Lord is saying, we train our spiritual ears, we train our hearts. And really, the more that we listen for God's voice, the more that we'll recognize how He speaks to us and how He's guiding us. And for other people, for different people, that can look different than it does for us. And it might be multiple different kinds of ways. Here's what I mean. As you listen and try not to presuppose what God is saying, for some of you that's probably easier than maybe it is for me. If you're a talker like me, It's hard to go quiet, and it's hard to not assume what you think God is going to say or tell you what you want to hear. Nevertheless, as we listen, maybe some of you, like me, might get a might be pointed in the right direction if, let's say, you're praying. And all of a sudden, you get this feeling in your body, let's say a shiver up and down your spine, that goes from the top of your head all the way down to your tail. And you're like, whoa, what happened? That happens with me from occasion, from time to time. And when I feel that in my body, I know it's like a guide marker. It's a signpost that God is trying to get my attention. That what I've just heard in my heart is leading me in a certain way. Now, it doesn't happen all the time. But maybe that happens for you too. Something similar. Sometimes God will speak to word in our spirits, in our souls, in our minds that maybe would sound different than your own voice. You know what your own voice sounds like. You know the types of things that you think. And sometimes a word comes out of the blue, whether we're reading Scripture or just thinking about something, and you hear this thought. And it's not something that you would normally say to yourself. Well, in those moments, God maybe perhaps is trying to give you guidance, trying to give you a direction. And and it's a way for you to say, hmm, is God trying to speak to me here in this moment? And and if so, it's, it's a moment to give ear, to pause, and to think. Is this of the Lord? Is this of me? Often, for most of us, God will speak to us through other people. Words that are positive, words that maybe we don't want to hear. God might be trying to lead us in a certain direction. And and it might come from a conversation with, let's say, one person. It might come from conversations with multiple people. But when we start hearing similar things from, from different people, perhaps it's God trying to give us a message. God trying to guide us in a certain way. And when we hear things like that, it gives us an opportunity to pause and go, hmm, Lord, are you saying something to me? Give ear. God's trying to train us on how to hear from Him. And again, it can be in multiple different ways. All this to be said, it, it takes time, but God wants us to become attuned to the very different ways that He speaks to us so that He can guide us in life, right? And that's what was going on with the disciples. Now this all said, when Peter, John, and the boys 
went up to Galilee to meet Jesus. I don't know from a reading of the scriptures if going fishing was a part of Jesus' instructions. We don't at least hear it in the word. It probably wasn't. They did as we often do. They didn't wait on the Lord. Now you think about the Sea of Galilee, right? It's, it's a big lake. It's a lot bigger than Harlan County Reservoir. You know, and they went up to the lake to meet Jesus. Well, suppose a friend of yours told you, Hey, Jason, let's meet up at the lake. Let's go fishing. Is he going to know exactly where I was thinking? Maybe. Maybe not. If we had gone fishing a lot before, if we had met up there a lot before, we would probably have our favorite place where we would meet up and then go fishing. But maybe not. So it's possible that the boys just weren't in the right location. They weren't in the same location as where Jesus expected them to be. But most likely, they knew the spot. A few of them grew up right around the lake. And Jesus had a base of operations around the Sea of Galilee, where they would have most likely had met up quite often. So it's most likely that, yeah, they were there, and Jesus just hadn't arrived yet. And so in their (sighs) anxiousness, in their waiting, they got tired of waiting and decided to do their own thing instead. And they decided just to go fishing. They just didn't wait. They did their own thing. And like the disciples, without Jesus' guidance, without His presence in our lives, right, our efforts can be unsuccessful even if our intentions are good in life. I'm sure Peter's intentions were great. I'm sure the disciples' intentions were great. But because Jesus wasn't guiding them in that exact moment to go grab a boat and go out fishing, they came up short all night long. Like them, without God's guidance in our lives, right? On how to go, where to go, when to go, and what to do. Even when our intentions are good, even if our intentions are to evangelize, right? Our nets could come up empty even if we're working together as a team. But on the flip side of that, when we partner with Jesus... We're able to do great things for the Lord and for the kingdom of God. We hear a little bit about that as we go back and pick up. Now, I believe, around verse 5. Pick up at verse 4, excuse me. And we hear this. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach. But the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you got any fish? Uh Uh-uh, they replied. And then he said, throw out your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fishing. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And he put on his tunic for he'd stripped for work, jumped in the water, and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to shore, for they were only about a hundred yards off from the shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and the net hadn't torn. Now come, have some breakfast. Jesus said again. And then pick up on this. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. We just heard that the new day was dawning, right? So imagine this is sometime around sunrise. Imagine going out to the football field here in town, and it's around daybreak. Maybe it's around golden hour. The sun is just coming up. You stand at one end of the football field right underneath the goalpost, and your friend goes down to the other. 
depending on the direction you're facing, that could cause a silhouette. But if the light isn't fully up, and if your eyes aren't perfect like 2020 or 2010 vision, you might not know exactly who that is at the other end, unless you know darn well it was your, with your friend. But if you were there and you didn't know who was down there 100 yards away, you might not recognize that person. So it's possible just because of the distance, they didn't recognize Jesus. But they did hear his voice. They did recognize his voice. They heard Jesus calling to the disciples from the shoreline. And when he asks, have you caught anything? They answered, dismayed, no. If you've ever been out fishing all night or even all day and you haven't caught a thing, you're going to be a little downcast, right? Especially if you make your living from this. It'd be like you having 450 wells going and coming up exactly dry all day. You should see Jason just roll his eyes back. Imagine that type of thought. It'd be like you expecting one thing but coming up exactly short. Jesus knew this would be the case, so he instructed his disciples, as he'd done three years earlier in almost the same exact manner, to cast their nets onto the other side of the boat. And again, the disciples heard that instruction, right? They listened, and they followed through. And just then, Jesus caused the massive haul to come into their nets, so big, in fact, that they couldn't pull the entire school of fish into the boat. We need to hear this. This is all Jesus. This is 100% Jesus. He is the causation. He made it happen. It didn't happen by happenstance. The disciples didn't cause it to happen. It wasn't on any great effort of their own. This is all Jesus. But even that said, there were two things that the disciples did. And they did it to partner with the Lord. They listened intently. And then they took action. And that principle applies for us too, right? If we want to catch fish for the Lord, we got to act too. Because the fish just ain't going to jump into the boat, right? We get this, especially in real life, right? If you go out here fishing on the reservoir, and I know a bunch of you guys like to do, do that. I'm sure some of you gals too. You're less, well, excuse me, you're more likely to catch fish if you use a fish finder, right? Imagine that fish finder being like guidance from the Lord. You're more likely to catch fish if you're going to use the right kind of bait or just bait at all, right? Using the right methods, in other words, right tools. You're more than likely to catch more fish if you go to the right location on the lake. Because again, they're just, not going to jump into the boat. Anybody ever have that happen where a fish just jumped up out of the water and landed in the boat? It's a probably a pretty rare thing. And you're probably like, wow, thank you, Lord. What a gift, right? But let me ask you a question. You know where this is going. Why then is it that as Christians in the United States, do we often think that the fish are just going to jump into our boats? I mean, stated another way, why do we think that new believers are just going to walk in the door, give their life to Christ, and just say, hey, I want to join the church? It's rhetorical. Because most often than not, I mean, on a rare occasion, a fish does jump into the boat. But on most occasions, it just doesn't work that way. Right? If we want fish to come into the boat, We want fish to come into the net. We got to be guided. We got to go out. We got to cast our nets. We we have to want to catch fish for the Lord. And that's presuming as a church that we want to grow and make an impact for the kingdom of God as the disciples did. Well, after seeing that their nets were full that morning, right, John recognized what and whom was at play. And in his exuberance, we hear what he said 
to Peter. He's like, it's the Lord, right? And Peter, again, so excited. And Peter just being Peter, right? He just, he, he puts on the rest of his clothes because he just had a swimming suit on, right? And he jumps into the water and he heads straight for Jesus. Now, maybe he grabbed that bow line of the boat and he started to pull the boys in. We don't exactly know. Maybe he just kind of left them, a, you know, just ditched them and went straight for the shore. We hear the rest of it that the other six did the best that they could to grab those fish, to hold on to that net and get that boat to shore. Again, about 100 yards off. But they worked together. They worked together to get that fish and to get that boat to shore. And they met up with Jesus who had prepared for them a breakfast. And then he instructed them, bring me the fish. And Peter, strong man Peter, grabbed that net that the other six had a hard time wrangling and he pulls it to shore. Now there's some metaphor going on here that I want you to be attuned to. I want you to think of that boat as the church. I want you to think of that shore as heaven's shores. And I want you to think of Jesus not just as Jesus the man, but Jesus as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who created all that there is. One with the Father, one with the Son, one with the Holy Spirit, the triune God, right? The disciples were working together to haul those brand new fish into heaven's shores. And this means that we got to work together too as a team. We got to be of one mind, one thought, one ear to listen. We have to be of one crew. And partner with our captain, who is Jesus Christ, to push off safely from the shore, actively go fishing. And then when Jesus puts the fish into our net, to work as a team together to bring those nets back to the Lord on the heaven shores. As Christians in the United States, we're really comfortable sitting on the dock. where it's safe, where it's nice. Sometimes we cast a line. Sometimes we even put bait on the end. Sometimes we sit in the boat, but we don't ever push the boat off from shore. Now, some people are happy casting a line or two all by themselves, and they do catch a few fish for the Lord. But if we sincerely want to make a difference as Christians in the United States for the Lord, then it can't just be one or two people doing all the work. we got to work together as a body to go fishing for the Lord. Even the best fishing duos of life, like our very own Joel and Tim, they can't bring in a massive haul by themselves. They need a bigger team. I believe in the church in the United States can make a big difference if we really want to. I believe we as a congregation can make a big difference if we really want to for the Lord. And I believe it will happen for the church in the United States and for us as local congregations when we actively choose to make it our mission to go fishing for the Lord. It's been my prayer for a long time, and it'll continue to be my prayer, no matter where I'm at, for wherever I'm at, for the whole church, and for even us here at Peace Lutheran, whether I'm here or not. I hope that's your prayer, too. You know, sitting on the dock or even in the boat is just fine, and it can be a fun thing to do. But wouldn't it be so much more fun to go out in the boat and to have Jesus bring in a massive haul of 153 or more? Here, fishy, fishy, fishy fish. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, there's a big ocean of people out there. There's a big sea of people out there. There's a lake full of people out here in our county that I believe, Jesus, you would put into the net if we went out there and cast it. But we have to want to. We have to want to get off the dock. We have to want to get out of the shack and go step in the boat, working together as a team. 
and to go fishing with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give us that desire as a church in the United States, Father God. Give us that desire as local congregations. Help us to go fishing for you. And with Jesus, to bring a massive haul onto heaven's shores. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.